organizing committee and the moderators for in inviting me to do this talk on immunotherapies. I know this is a topic that's gaining a lot of momentum and traction throughout the gastric cancer world, as well as throughout other tumor types. So I wanted to start off with a concept called tumor mutational burden. And this is kind of important to, to set the landscape of why immunotherapy works in gastric cancer. If you look at the tumors with the highest mutational burden, it actually tracks really well with the US FDA, the Food and Drug Administration approvals of the initial immunotherapy regimens in the country. They actually correlated with lung cancer, melanoma, um, and bladder cancer being more, one of the more higher mutational burdens. And I'm gonna tell you why that ties in. But I just wanted to point out right away that esophagus and gastric cancer is not too far behind these top four tumor mutational burden tumor types. And the reason why Dr. Klempner kind of mentioned this is that in patients with a defective DNA repair system, you have more mutations that develop in the tumor. And as you may all know from Dr. Klempner's talk, when you have more mutations, you produce more foreign proteins or antigens. The immune system loves different antigens that are foreign from your body. They just gather around it and they attack it. So this is why in tumor types with high MSI high, you have a propensity to respond to immunotherapy. Now, tumors are, including gastric cancers, are pretty smart. Even if you have, you know, an up, a higher number of mutations, they sometimes will express these proteins called PDL1, as you can see on the far right. And that actually is, as Dr. Klentner said, a kind of a stop sign. They tell your body's immune system, don't attack me, actually, I might be one of yours. So tumor cells can be pretty tricky. So this is where the immunotherapies come in. They actually block that checkpoint, that immune checkpoint, and this is why they call them immune checkpoint inhibitors. They release that stop sign and it allows your body's immune system to again attack the cancer and try to treat that. So when we talk about gastric cancer being an immune sensitive type of tumor, meaning is it a, a tumor type that has a propensity to respond to immunotherapy? And we already knew that dating a while back, as Dr. Klempner mentioned, we did have some tumors that were MSI high, EBV positive, which I'll talk about. And this is already a known fact that in May of 2017, the immune checkpoint inhibitor Keytruda or pembrolizumab was approved across several tumor types, including gastric cancer, that if you are MSI high and you, your tumor has grown on several other lines of chemotherapy, you are FDA approved to receive Keytruda, which, which is one of the immune therapy types. Now, I'm gonna talk more about the recent trials that have led to Keytruda being specifically approved in gastric cancer, not relying on that MSI high subtype. The Keynote 59 trial studied three groups of patients. I'm gonna talk about the first cohort, which is what led to the FDA approval. It was in patients with gastric cancer that was stage four or unresectable that had tumors that had grown on two prior regimens of chemotherapy. There were 259 patients enrolled, and they received this drug called Keytruda at this dosing every three weeks. Here is the overall response rate, about 30 patients or 11.6%. This is across the entire 259 patients that were enrolled. But as you can see here, it was really nice to see that six patients or 2.3% had a complete remission. These are patients that had been treated with several lines of therapy already and had absolute disappearance of their tumors on scans. These are the swimmers and spider plots. I just wanna show you to interpret these plots. The further you go to the right, the longer the response and benefit is going. And those tentacles, the further it goes down into the right, that's the patients that are benefiting long-term from these, uh, this therapy with shrinkage. And Dr. Klempner mentioned the waterfall plot, essentially with Keytruda here, those below that median bar is those with tumors that are shrinking. But I wanted to highlight that in this study, 57.1% of patients met the criteria for pdl one positive. As Dr. Klempner mentioned, that's a test that's done on your tumor tissue. 
And in fact, in those who were PDL1 positive, this was defined as the pathologist's interpretation of a score greater than one, that your response rate shrinkage was 15.5% versus 6.4% if your PDL1 was negative. And patients who were PDL1 positive had a longer duration response versus those who were negative. Some of the side effects were pretty common to the class of immunotherapies. I, I didn't want to go too much in detail, but fairly tolerable. And this study led in September 22nd, 2017, the FDA approved Keytruda or Pembrolizumab in patients with stage four gastric cancer who had PDL1 positive tests and had been treated with two or more prior lines of therapy. So this is set in stone. This is an FDA approved availability in gastric cancer patients. And one of the other reasons why Dr. Klempner mentioned you have to, you should be testing for PDL1 in addition to MSI high. I wanted to point out that in our Asian counterparts over there in Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, they separately did their own parallel study. This was investigating a similar population of patients, but to a different ch checkpoint inhibitor. This drug is called nivolumab or Opdevil. Similar type of mechanism as Keytruda. And I wanted to show you that they saw these patients in the bottom table, bottom uh, square there, were also previously heavily pretreated with two or more different types of chemotherapies. Here the response rates were pretty comparable. In the overall population, about 11% had shrinkage, durable responses. And these patients treated with nivolumab versus a placebo live longer in this instance as well. And I just wanted to highlight that nivolumab is a little bit different from Keytruda in that irrespective of PDL1 status, nivolumab worked, whether you were PDL1 positive or PDL1 negative. However, because this, this trial was predominantly in Asia, this led to the Japan version of the FDA approving this drug as an available option for patients who had been treated with two or more different chemotherapies. I just wanted to highlight what's going on when I'm meeting with uh, other oncologists from across the world, that they have, they're more using nivolumab in the Asian countries because of this availability. This is technically not approved in the US, but we have our own counterpart, the Keytruda uh, approval, which requires a pd one positivity. Just wanted to make that side caveat. Now, as oncologists, clinical researchers, we get really greedy. We wanna bring immunotherapy earlier, not in patients that have been treated that have to wait for two or more types of therapies. We wanna bring it earlier, you know, to the second line, to even the initial treating. So the, I'm gonna show you some studies of what we're working on to bring it sooner and earlier to our patients with stage four gastric cancer. Keynote 180 was a phase two global trial, again, of advanced and metastatic gastric cancers. There were several different cohorts, but I wanted to highlight that these patients uh, were also pretreated. Here, I wanted to highlight that about 50% of patients had what they call squamous cell carcinoma, and the other 50 had adenocarcinoma. This is a different type of histology that the pathologist determines what type of tumor cell along the gastroesophageal tract that your tumor arises from. And again, as you can see here, about 50% of patients were PDL1 positive. Here in the overall group of all patients, you saw that the response rates were about 10%, but the duration at the time of this study was not reached. That means there were still patients at the time of this publication that were still benefiting since the trial started a, a, you know, years in before this. What I wanted to highlight here is that the patients with the esophageal squamous type actually had a little bit higher response rates than those with the adenocarcinoma. And then those who were PDL1 positive, this is their score was a little bit different. Um, this one is using a score of 10 or higher rather than one, which was the previous study. In those with the PDL1, the 10 score of 10 or higher, their response rate to Keytruda or immunotherapy was a little bit higher than those who were negative. There was a second trial that was almost along the same time, similar population of patients. I'm gonna skip through this here, that the essentially in patients with the squamous cell type and a PDL1 score above 10, 
pembrolizumab was actually superior to chemo. This is a little different now. They actually pitted it head to head with chemo in this trial, when in the other instances it was compared to placebo or you know, just single arm trial. So with this constellation of these two studies, just this year in July 30th, 2019, if you have a gastro or esoph sorry, esophageal cancer of squamous cell histology and your PDL1 positivity score is greater than 10, then you are actually able to receive an FDA approved indicated pembrolizumab now no longer in the third line, but you can get it earlier in the second line. So what about adenocarcinoma? The, you know, a lot of more predominant tumor histology probably here in the Western countries. In the second line, this question was sought after in this study here, Keynote 61. It's, it was a phase three large study where they compared pembrolizumab, which is the immunotherapy, versus a standard kind of second line chemotherapy called paclitaxel. And then again, this was patients who were metastatic or unresectable who had previously been treated already with one line of chemotherapy. As you can see here, the blue curve is the pembrolizumab group and the red curve is the chemo paclitaxel group. Generally, you want the, the, the investigational drug, the curve to be a little bit higher to show improvement in survival. Unfortunately, as you can see here, the curves cross right around 12 months or so, and it actually showed that pembrolizumab did not beat out chemotherapy in this instance. And so this was, at the moment of this publication, which I think was a year ago, it was a head scratcher for us researchers. We were really hoping that pembrolizumab would beat out chemotherapy in the second line setting, as it had been proven to be pretty beneficial in the third line. There were a lot of debates about, you know, the patient subgroups are different. The patients with pembrolizumab, if you look a little bit further into the study, had a little bit different disease biology than those with the chemotherapy. And this is probably what could have explained why it couldn't beat out paclitaxel in this instance. But a different way to look at it is that we actually need to look at a lot of different, better ways of identifying who would benefit from immunotherapy versus those who can't. Because obviously this, this was a negative study that prompted a lot of going back to the drawing board about who's gonna benefit from these Keytruda nivolumab agents. So what do we know right now as of, in terms of the immune predictors or biomarkers of response to immunotherapy? This was a very important study published in 2014 in Nature, where they essentially sequenced the mutational profile of patients with gastric cancer. And the authors found out that there were four main types that they can categorize gastric cancer patients into. What I wanted to point out was that EBV, Dr. Klempner may have already mentioned, that this subtype actually has a couple of features. It's located in a specific part more often in the stomach. And it also has a tendency to have higher levels of PDL1. The other type was MSI high, as we have talked about, with higher mutational burden. This tends to be more in the body and antrum as well. And then the, another group eventually, about three years later, mapped out the esophagus, the upper tract as well. And then they added this, a fifth subtype, on top of the gastric cancer four subtypes here. What I want to show you again in this red box is still those with the most studied biomarkers being MSI high and PDL1 were still located a little bit more distally in the gastroesophageal tract, more around the gastroesophageal junction and even into the stomach itself. But what I wanted to tease out is beyond PDL1 and MSI high, as Dr. Klempner mentioned, those are still only a small percentage of patients that can help us predict benefit to immunotherapy. What are we doing to get more pieces of that pie, get more patients that are eligible and are gonna benefit from these immunotherapies. I've put together two of the major studies that I've previously discussed that have led to immunotherapy approvals. If you look at these patient subsets, 
one thing you'll notice is that although a lot of them tend to favor and respond to immunotherapy, there were a, sub, a subtype in both, two, in both uh, cohorts where this bar here, if it crosses that middle line in the middle, means that it didn't really re respond. This group didn't, really didn't respond to immunotherapy. And this group is actually a, a, what we call diffuse subtypes of gastric cancer. And we already knew this from the TCGA data set that I showed. The patients with diffuse histologic subtypes of gastric cancer was already known what they call a genomically stable tumor type. Some people might even call it an immune desert, not an immune reactive type of tumor, but a very tough tumor to get responsiveness to immunotherapy. But investigators have even looked into diffuse gastric cancers They've profiled patients specifically with diffuse gastric cancer to still try to find out, are there still patients within this subgroup that could benefit from immunotherapy? And this is what this study showed, actually that there was. In terms of, they classified it into three groups, PX1, PX2, and PX3. This is all diffuse gastric subtypes. They found that PX3, all those red dots there, tended to have a lot of mutations, more so than the other ones. And they actually showed that PX3 is, was actually a little bit more resistant to chemotherapy, but that this subgroup may be more active and be a prime candidate for immunotherapy. So again, even in a subgroup where you thought immunotherapy may not be a beneficial, we're still kind of chipping away and trying to find patients that could benefit within this subgroup as well. Now, what about EBV? Dr. Klempner mentioned this. This is now a growing area of interest beyond pdl one and MSI high. As Dr. Klentner mentioned, in this study, patients that were treated with pembrolizumab, if you had EBV status, those were those bars in the yellow, you had a 100% chance of responding to immunotherapy. Your chances of responding when you were MSI high were 85.7%. The most, thing, most important thing I wanted to point out in this study was that EBV and PDL1, sorry, EBV and MSI high were mutually exclusive. You, would, you, would, you, would, you may want to ask, well, maybe the patients with MSI high were EBV positive too, and that's why you're seeing the response. That wasn't the case in this study. Actually, EBV patients did not have MSI high, and this was a separate group that had a very high responsiveness to immunotherapy. Tumor mutational burden, uh, we can't escape that again. It's a different measure of how many mutations are in your tumor type. It was already shown a long time ago that in stage four gastroesophageal cancer patients, about 295 patients, if they actually counted the number of mutations in your tumor, those who had a cutoff, they called it greater than 9.7 mutations per megabase, your outcomes were much better, as you can see here with the overall survival numbers. And the cool thing about this now is those was, that was looked for in the tumor tissues if you actually look for it in the circulating tumor DNA, now this is not a biopsy, this is a blood test, a peripheral blood test, skipping the invasiveness of a biopsy, you could actually measure uh, mutational burden in the peripheral blood too. And what did it show here? That just like in the tissue, if you had a higher tumor mutational burden, your chances of responding to immunotherapy were much better. So this, tumor mutational burden in both the circulating tumor DNA or peripheral blood and tissue correlate with response to pembrolizumab. So this is something that's undergoing development and hopefully will make its way to the mainstream as well. What about other concepts that are being investigated right now? TILS, this stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. Now these are actually looking at the immune cells, how much there are getting close and getting ready to attack the tumor. It was already shown in earlier studies that if you have a higher tumor infiltrating lymphocyte count or higher TILS count in your tumor, your outcomes were better, patients live longer. Now, how does this relate, however, to immunotherapy? In a separate study where they did gene sequencing, meaning they mapped out 29 immune genes, the investigators were able to stratify patients with gastric cancer into three groups. There is the immune high group in the middle, intermediate, and those immune low. And pretty much those who had in the immune high group 
had a higher number of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, act, actual uh, immune cells that were getting ready to attack the tumor. These patients had the best prognosis. But what I wanted to mention here is that in the immune high group, 50% of them were EBV positive or MSI high. So again, you can argue maybe it's the EBV positive or the MSI high that's actually accounting for this response to immunotherapy. But actually 50% of them were MSI, were MSS, the opposite of MSI high or EBV negative. So just looking at the population of immune cells that are infiltrating close to the tumor could be another surrogate marker of predicting who's gonna be the best candidate for immunotherapy. Another test that's been under the development is that they're actually looking at genes that are expressed for a panel of immune pathways. And this is pretty much, it's now going into a score. Instead of looking at, let's just say, tumor imputational burden, looking at MSI high, looking at pdl one they're actually using a composite of genes that signify your T cells or your immune cells are highly active, and it punches out a score for you. And those with higher scores did have better outcomes with immunotherapy. And this is shown in a different study as well. And I think this is, this last example that I'm showing you is actually I think one of the more interesting directions that we're going with immunotherapy, rather than picking out one test, PDL1, MSI high, or EBV status, why not lump it into a composite score of all the parameters that we can imagine and punch out a score that would predict your response to immunotherapy? And that's where I think where the future is going with these uh, gene expression profiling. What I wanted to talk about is very quickly that what about now moving, we talked about indications in the third and second line, what about moving immunotherapy right up front to the first line? This was investigated in this study here, a large population, 700 patients with metastatic gastric cancer. The findings here are pretty interesting and I think we're still awaiting the final results to be able to interpret this completely. But essentially what it showed that is if you had a PDL positivity score of greater than 10, that pembrolizumab alone was non-inferior to chemotherapy. So this is something that is under active investigation in patients if we could really pioneer and move immunotherapy to the first line. And because for right now, as you can all know, first line treatment of gastric cancer does involve chemotherapy at this moment. And this, is, this study is potentially pointing out that we could maybe in the right patient and right subpopulation start off with immunotherapy right off the bat. Now I've talked about biomarkers as ways of identifying patients to respond to immunotherapy. Why not combine immunotherapy with other agents and see if that can enhance the efficacy? This is one of the trials comparing immunotherapy nivolumab with an oral pill. You take the pill every day, and then you take the immunotherapy once every two weeks. And this has actually shown some pretty promising resp responses in patients with gastric cancer. Almost 50% of patients had tumor shrinkage. This was in patients that had otherwise biomarkers that were absent for immunotherapy. Again, another concept is why not do double immunotherapy instead of one immunotherapy drug? Can we combine two immunotherapy drugs to make your immune uh, system even more stronger, treat the cancer in that regard? This is an ongoing study here, a phase three trial. Uh, they're actually gonna compare nivolumab and another immune therapy agent, ipilimumab versus standard chemo. And the results of this study is eagerly anticipated to see if combination immunotherapy is the way to go. There's other trials that are now pairing non-chemo options with, with immunotherapy, and this is radiation therapy, actually. In this study, they would actually radiate patients with, radiate one of their spots before giving them immunotherapy and then measuring what the response is. And our group has shown before, why would you pair radiation therapy with immunotherapy? It actually shows that with radiation therapy, for some reason, it's almost like you're priming the immune system. Um, and it's been documented pretty historically in the literature that once you have 
once you've been primed the, the, the immune system with radiation therapy, and you just drop some immunotherapy afterwards, the tumor response can be further enhanced. And that's another avenue of interest with these combination therapies. So lastly, I just wanted to conclude that immune checkpoint blockade is exquisitely effective in the right patient with gastroesophageal cancer. And again, that's going back to Dr. Klentner's talk about which tests you absolutely need to test for upon diagnosis. There's potential for clinically meaningful duration of responses. And beyond MSI, EBV, and pd one future investigations need to either investigate additional biomarkers to select for patients that are responding or novel combinations of therapy that can enhance the immunotherapy response. Thank you. Thank you.